Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. Ricardo, welcome. Please introduce yourself to the audience. So I'm Ricardo Trangen. I'm a political economist and a senior researcher with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, a think tank that has been around for some 40 years. Um, we're known as number crunchers. We're also described as left-leaning. Uh, we have had uh, very strong uh, relationships with the labor movement and other social movements for, for many, many years. Uh, before working at the CCPA, I did a gig within government for four years at the city of Toronto. I was uh, helping to develop the poverty reduction strategy. Um, and before that, I was hiding in academia for a few years. What caught my attention was obviously your book, The Tenant Class. And our audience will know that we feel really strongly about tenant organizing as a solution to many of the woes that uh, face us outside of labor organizing. So we definitely want to get into this a little bit more. But I think we're guilty sometimes of doing what you describe in your book as focusing on policies and government funding as points of pressure and as avenues for at least a modicum of change. And we often frame people's inability to afford a home and the amount of unhoused people there are as a housing crisis. I'm sure you're cringing as I say that. You you really want to refocus the discussion there because your book is primarily about challenging that narrative. You argue, amongst many other things, that what we often see in, in meme form, right, that capitalism is broken, it's working as it's intended, that also applies to the housing market for many, many reasons that we, we will gleefully get into here. It is, in fact, designed and working exactly as it's supposed to, right? Extracting wealth from the working class and pushing it upwards. So what was your impetus in writing that that in dedicating that book to the tenant class. Yes, it, it's the idea for the book started at the same time than the COVID pandemic, in fact. Uh, back in March 2020, uh, when the pandemic hit and there were all sorts of necessary lockdown measures put in place, uh, one interesting thing that happened then was that all the pundits and think tanks and researchers that spend their entire life criticizing government and arguing that we need less of it and pushing for budget cuts and all of that, they were nowhere to be seen. My theory is that they were hiding in their basements. And then the media start calling us, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, quite a bit. Because you guys are the ones that always think that government should, you know, should and could step in and that we do have the resources. And so what should governments be doing at this point? So back at the CCPA, we had a big you know, meeting and saying, OK, you know, all hands on deck. What are we going to do? This is an opportunity to step in and, and, and shape policy. And then immediately my reaction was, I'm going to start writing about housing. Um, tenants cannot make through this. Um, I've done a lot of research on low and moderate income households. I know how little savings they have. I know how reliant they are on employment income. I know they work for the exact jobs that have been just shut down. Um, so so I, that was my reaction. Was also There was also a personal angle there. I, I grew up in Brazil in the 1980s. Um, really tough kind of economic situation. I was in a low income family. We got two renovations that sort of marked my my childhood and 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 you know there's pretty um strong and, and painful memories to this day and so somewhat that context me brought me back to that 
that space too. So I said, like, I'm going to do housing. So I started doing more work on housing, on rental housing specifically, which I hadn't been doing much before. And then the, the tenant movements start uh, providing me with positive feedback and say, oh, there's something different about the way you write about this. We don't hear that perspective as often. And it's been more useful than other stuff that we have access to. And then with the York Southwestern Tenant Union, they even start asking me, you know, actually, you know, if you had time to do this kind of analysis on this specific thing, it would be helpful to us. And I was like, okay, I can find time. And, and then that's where my relationship with the movement started. And at some point, I wrote a two pager and I said, if I were to sink my teeth on this, um, this is what I would write. I would do a class analysis of this, which I think um, would be just in a way, capturing the perspective that you already, um, your clear eyed view of this by the time I spent not only with the York Southwestern Tenant Union, but with other tenant groups. And I circulated, I circulated, you know, to six, seven groups across the country. And the basic question was, would this be useful? And, and then it was an enthusiastic yes as a reply. And then I was like, okay, so if, you know, I'm not an organizer, I don't know how to organize people. I know only how to organize semi columns and and, and and decimal points but if if I can be of of help that way I'm glad to so that's how the book came about and then throughout the process I, I reached back to to some of these groups and asked them to read drafts and provide feedback and and that's how the tenant class came about okay I'm gonna get you to explain to our audience what I meant by the fact that you're probably cringing at the term housing crisis. I'm sure if I did a search and find of our transcripts, I have used that term an embarrassingly amount of times now that I have read what I read. So I agree, like, I didn't, I'll, I'll admit, like, I haven't read the entire book, but from the excerpts that I have writ, read, I have shifted some perspective or at least reminded myself of the givens that that are being taken for granted when we have these discussions but the fact that calling it a crisis is kind of one of them can you kind of unpack that for our audience because i'm sure they use the term and, and don't understand they understand that language is important but perhaps they haven't caught this one so, sometimes i use that term too it's inevitable and it's there and 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 my 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 problem with that is that when we talk about a housing crisis, it depicts the situation that we are in as something that is unexpected, as something that impacts everyone, or at least most people, equally and negatively. And most importantly, it depicts us as something that would all have an interest in solving. And I think that characterization, it's not very accurate first and definitely not useful. We have had the same structure for our housing system for decades and decades and decades, more than a century, depending how you, you count it. It has always been that we are going to try and get the middle class to buy homes and they will achieve both housing security and long term financial security in that way. Those who can buy a house, they will fend for themselves in the rental market. And good luck. Sometimes we put some regulations when things get really bad, but as soon as things get a little bit better, we remove those regulations and we allow profit to go wild. For those that are very, very poor, we're gonna provide a small number of social housing units, just as kind of a residual thing. This is, has been the structure of the housing market for so long and in all of these different moments where we kind of we face some increased levels of hardship and there were more and more there were larger numbers of people who were being able to 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 meet the rent and so on there were proposals for doing things different uh, and you couldn't go back to like the early, like as early as La that's like 1911, 12, 13. And, and people saying, well, maybe we should remove a larger share of, of, of the housing units out of the market, have a larger share of homes that are not for profit. And the Canadian state has always answered the same way, which was, that's a great idea. But no, we're just going to throw money at developers instead and see if they can get us out of this. That has been repeatedly the way we chose to go. So to call this a crisis would suggest that 
the outcome that we see now wasn't expected where is expected where it's not only expected but it was seen many times before and then to to the other point is when we call it a crisis we tend to think that everyone's going to get around the table and bring the really good ideas and great intentions and trying to solve this because it's a crisis right this notion of crisis is like we all want to get rid of this and that's not that couldn't be farthest from the truth um, we have people who immensely benefit from the way things are. Not only they don't want things to change, they are actively involved in keeping things the same way. So that's one of the things that I've been emphasizing even more that, that I wish I had emphasized more in the book is that it takes a lot of resources and energy to keep things the way they are. And there's a lot of energy spent on it every single day. And, and there's even lobbying to making things slightly worse from the tenant's perspective. So that's why I don't like the language crisis. It, 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 we are in, in, a, in a class struggle between those who are immensely benefiting from this and those who are paying the price. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly frustrating for me, all of the discourse around housing, because it just feels like we're constantly being gaslit, you know. When we have like we talk about how developers are the most powerful people in municipal politics, that they own our municipal politics, not just in major cities, but in smaller municipalities as well. If they given the power that they have, if they wanted to make sure that there was a, an adequate housing supply, they could do that easily. And the fact that they don't tells you everything you need to know about that. And then the other part that's really frustrating for me is. Instead of, you know, conversations, systemic conversations about how we came to this, what's wrong? Well, what's the conversation right now? Oh, it's migrants' fault. We have too much migrants. It's the international students who are all living eight people in a basement in Brampton crammed together because they don't have any other alternative. And so everything around the the public discourse feels incredibly far away from actually talking about any solutions whatsoever and we're all just kind of blaming and looking in the wrong places right i just want to jump in because that reminds me of one of i think the most important points in that how framing of a crisis discussion that you have in the book is it's assumed it's like of unknown origin <laughs> The crisis, it has that natural disaster language around it as though it came from nowhere and, you know, there's got to be some magical formula solution and, and, and we're very rarely naming the problem. I think you've got a line in there that something like rents don't rise, landlords raise rents. And it, I read it a couple times before it all of the implicate, probably not all, many implications sunk in. And, and one of them is what Santiago is talking about, that scapegoating. When you just say rents rise, it implies there's so many factors at play. Inflation, cost of lumber, migrants, right? Like there can be all these talking points surrounding this crisis. And the reality is there is one problem and there are individuals and companies that are using their land ownership to extract as much of the working class's income as they can possibly. That's important. That focus in the conversation is pivotal because without it, we're all looking in many, many, many different directions. And, you know, you need fish to all swim the same way. Yes, I, I'm often asked to talk about policy solutions. And my reaction often is, can I talk about po political responses instead, right? So we, uh, one, as, as, as Latin American and as someone who, you know, my academic work was a lot of focus on Latin American politics, one thing that constantly surprises me is the is pace, um, it's how much space the policy conversation takes versus 
the political conversations, right? And one of the things that the policy conversation does and the, the policy pundits do, and, you know, by all means, this is my, that's my J job. So I'm, I'm, I'm included in that. I to point like, that out to you, Ricardo. Like yes, maybe I, they're I, looking I, for you to policy because you work for the Pol- Center for Policy Alternatives. I know. I like every single day I try to maybe talk the alternative myself out of a job. Policy. That's, a, that's a misread of the title. These <laughs> yes. are alternatives to policy. Yes, that's really good. I should try that. But yeah, every day I try to talk talk myself out of a job one day i think i will <laughs> will do it but until i don't so but but the entire language of policy policy one thing that is it does it removes agency from the conversation you read entire policy reports then don't have a single subject on it even even the the, the slightly more more elaborate and in detail analysis of how we got here what you hear is government stop funding you know non-market housing um, in the 1970s. Yep. Oh, I've had that conversation. I sounded very intelligent. <laughs> it, and, 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 and those are facts. So, so we say, well, we, we, look, rent controls have weakened over time. We haven't built enough house uh, since the 1970s market and um, rent purpose purpose built rental units like apartment buildings. Uh, we also haven't built enough social housing. So no social housing, uh, not enough rental units, weak wind controls, it leads to what we're seeing right now. But but what are the subjects on, on that sentences, on those sentences, right? Who stop funding rental house? Why? Who stop funding uh, or, or providing any sorts of incentives for the for the construction of purpose-built rentals? Who changed legislation to weaken rent controls? And also the J- agency on the other side, which, you know, half of the book is about tenant organizing since since before Confederation, because there's agency on both sides, right? There's agency from the part of those deliberate doing this, but there's a lot of good, you know, fighting happening to resist all of this. So, so, so yeah, hence that sentence, you know, like, and it should be a three-part sentence. Like, you know, rents don't go up, landlords raise rents, and tenants fight the shit out of it. <laughs> I think that amendment is necessary. Yes. I, let, let's hear about more of that history, because for me, it feels really new. I feel like I lived through a, a period of perhaps not enough tenant organizing. And so watching the rent strikes erupt in Toronto is refreshing to me. But you're looking at it from a more historical lens where there's perhaps hope in seeing previous victories. Because like a rent strike to most people sounds outrageous, right? Which makes it so special that they're happening. Uh, tenants often feel very powerless. So the more the more stories of victories we could share, the better. So you say from the time of Confederation, tenants have been fighting the shit out of this. Yes. Yeah, so one of the most valuable assets that capital owns is history. Capital's ability to tell history according to their own perspective and to name who are the heroes and the bandits and who led to what and who did what and how is extremely important for them. And so when we learn history in this country, it's always from one laureate to another McDonald's, back to some laureate, back to some Trudeau. And it's always the history of, of some, you know, enlightened man in some chateau in Ottawa deciding the future of the country. Um, And it's a very inaccurate and, again, unhelpful way of telling history. Uh, The history of this country and of other countries is full of resistance, it's organizing and then fighting back. And the history of, of, of common people and popular movements is so much more interesting and such so more uh, much more rich than than it's portrayed it to be um, so i think that it is part of movement building and it is part of our resistance to 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 recover that history to share that history to make that history part of what our children learn and growing up knowing um, so that they do know that there are alternatives there are people who will fight this and who always have fought this and that when you know they get to the right age it's going to be their turn to fight until they can't and someone else is going to take it over for, for them um, so with all of that in mind 
the first chapter of the second part of the book looks at history of, of movements. Um, they're not only in the big cities. My first chap my first account is of Prince Edward Island farmers um, fighting um, absentee landlords. And um, then you go to um, Nova Scotia and, and to BC and to Ontario. And there are many other uh, examples that I could have given. I picked a few that I found kind of representative and for which uh, some, some sort of data or, or account was available. Uh, and it's just to remind all of us that we have, we have done this for a very long time. I'm assuming rent strikes are not the only tactic that have been employed to quote unquote fight landlords. What other tactics have been used that were successful that perhaps we're not employing right now? Absolutely. Rent strikes are one form of collective action. And it might be the right one, the right place, but is also a risk one and cannot be employed every time anywhere. Other forms include um, include pressure in government, um, but not on, on in the next policy tweak and not in the next, you know, not through a, a formal consultation process, but having enough um, broad support um, from from movements, um, including labor, as labor used to be a lot more involved in rental housing uh, fights, to put a broad political pressure on governments to act in some way. Um, and sometimes it was to build more non-market housing, sometimes it was to, to enact rent controls, and so on and so forth. There are also forms of collective action that we see today is just resisting, resisting eviction, resisting demolitions, um, resisting um, any process of, of displacement and getting on the way of, of it um, and, and bringing enough um, popular support and public attention to it as to um, change the course of, of, of the process. And we saw that like in the 1960s and 1970s when we had um, a lot of those, um, I mean, we still do, but you know, in the 1960s and 1970s, a lot of those process of, of large scale gentrification were, or government sponsored through the, the kind of the ideology of urban renewal and, and movements got, you know, on the way of that. There's also processes of reclaiming public housing um, and trying to change the philosophy of it. And I'm thinking of particularly uh, Habitation Jean Mans uh, in Quebec, where public house came with a lot of a stigma and a lot of, of um, the philosophy was the philosopher disciplining the poor, right? We'll give you house, but you have to behave kind of philosophy. And and the tenants organized and, 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 and resisted that kind of, 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 of paternalizing approach and, and, and disciplining of, of, of the housing provider and, 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 and trying to, to shift things around. Um, so yes, there are many forms of collective action. It's in the, in the end of the day, as with you know, other movements, um, it is decided locally and, and hopefully democratically um, what makes sense for the movement to do given, you know, many, many different variables and what people feel is their, is their strength and, and their need. Uh, but yeah, they all can be more or less successful depending on the context. One thing I want to ask about is, you know, when um, when I talk to people from my generation about housing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 25, you know, nobody has any uh, ambitions of ever owning a house or owning an apartment they've kind of dismissed that as an impossibility. But a lot of those that still hold on to it talk about, um, you know, bubbles bursting, right? They talk about housing crashes. And they're kind of holding on to that as hope that when this overinflated market crashes, they'll suddenly be able to um, get into the housing market, right? What do you think about that kind of analysis and whether or not, because I mean, it, it, it definitely is a short term windows of a possible solution, but it doesn't seem to address at all any of these larger problems, uh, right? Mm -hmm. What I hear when I say that is folks equating housing security with home ownership 
in our culture in Canada and in other places, those two are very strongly attached um, because in many ways, it sucks to be a tenant, right? It sucks. It doesn't need to, but it does presently uh, because regulations are so weak that um, you enroll your kid, you know, for first grade in a school and you don't know if by the end of the school year they're going to still be in the same school. You don't know if you're going to be asked to move, to, you know, any time um, and how many months you're going give to give them to move and so on and so forth. In many places in, in Canada and right now, there are absolutely no rent controls. So you can even budget uh, for your next couple of years because you don't know how much rent you're going to go up and buy. Um, eviction is a purely administrative process that most often just goes through it without, um, without a hearing, without um, any other um, more uh, stronger legal scrutiny. Um, so it is very, it feels very insecure to financially and, and, and emotionally um, as since, you know, community and, 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 and roots are so important uh, to be a tenant. So what's the alternative? You buy a place. And that's how we, you know, have trying to solve this problem. Um, but ideally, we would start thinking about what it would take to make, you know, renting a, a more viable long-term alternative that folks are no, so, not so desperate to, to, to get out of it, right? Uh, if, 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 if you look at um, a lot of the co-op housing and some non-market profit providers and a lot of social housing, one thing you see is not only lower rents, which obviously isn't important, but you see very long tenure compared to the private market, right? People people go in and they make it they make it home and they make it for a long time. Um, and they just kind of build a life around it. And it's possible for them to do so because they don't have um, anyone, you know, kind of aiming to increase Profit at in at every single corner, uh, you know, building behind, building under, kind of behind their neck, whatever the expression is. <laughs> um, so yes, I think that's the, the the key for me is that is that is the equating security, from like you know people don't buy homes because they love spending the Sunday fixing the basement. It's because they you know want their kids to go to the same school you know through JK to twelve. I I think it also is part. It fails to challenge that very important narrative. One of those givens that just underlies all of these discussions is that owning property is the solution when we know the existence of private property is the problem. And so although that might be an individual solution, maybe not, right? Maybe they end up house poor or, or, or whatnot, but clearly that's not a systemic solution that isn't a solution for everyone and then it just reinforces that idea that there should you know our, our infinite or our finite amount of land should be divvied up to some even though we know it can't be to all right it would never erase that kind of divide that you talk about that that tenant landlord class I want to talk about that a little bit because I know there's a lot of traditional Marxists listening, <laughs> probably, considering uh, the flavor of our show. And quite often, class is described, and by us, uh, as the working class and capital. Now, there are other terms that we can use that Marx used, but to try to be as accessible as possible to people, you know, the, the owners of the means of production and the rest of us, <laughs> okay? And... You frame it a little bit differently for the purpose of talking about housing, and that is a tenant landlord class division. I'll let you explain it because you'll do it much better than I can, obviously. But also, I have a question embedded in there for the Friends of Santiago and all those people that are homeowners, but clearly part of the working class as per Marxist definition. So is there an in-between then? Is there tenants, homeowners, and then landlords? Because not everybody, are you a landlord as soon as you are the lord of ye land? You don't necessarily have to charge someone rent. Because like, that's my definition of a landlord. Like you have a renter, but there's people who just own a home. They're house poor. They're working two jobs. Like clearly they're working class. So can you help me unpack that a little bit, Ricardo? <laughs> yes. Thank you. So the tenant class, as you 
the title suggests, um, argues that landlords on one side and tenants on the other side is a core class struggle that defines our times and that we, we should think about the housing question through those lenses of, of, of two classes with um, opposing interests um, going at it. Uh, and there is no win-win policy solution. One side has to give. Um, and time and time and time again, it has been the tenant class. And the only way to turn this around is for the tenant class to have more power um, and to build that power through organizing and, and, and take it away from, from, from the landlord class. Um, so there are two ways of, of, of defending that argument, if we will. Um, one that is a little bit more pragmatic and the, one, the other that is a little bit more theoretical. The pragmatic side is that Latin Americans have always felt very comfortable using Marxist terms loosely as long as suits our political agenda. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, and you can see that a Latin, throughout. A Latino creative license? Yes, we, okay. the, the, more than anything, the, 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 the focus has been on the struggle at hand. And we use these concepts and, and, this, and this theoretical work instrumentally to serve our political projects, our emancipatory political projects. And there's this overall sense, at least in my, on my part, that if, if you're doing so with the purpose of, of supporting an emancipatory project, in the end of the day, the Marxist gods will forgive you and you'll be fine. <laughs> oh, that's the my Bernie hope. The Bernie bros might not, but <laughs> history will judge you. Uh, and uh, so that's my hope. So so if you go back a little bit and, and what we were saying earlier, how we talk a lot about policy versus, you know, political res policy solutions versus political responses. One of, 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 of the side effects of that is that we break everything into little pieces because that's kind of that's what policy discussions do that's what government consultations do is to cut everything in little pieces and to to lose sight of you know of the big macroeconomic picture and to divide people frankly between those who want child care and those who want uh, 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 housing those who want better income supports and those who want better jobs you know because they're all in different tables in these government consultations and so on and so forth so for me, it was really important when, when putting forward an alternative perspective or alternative framing on the housing question to do in a way that unites instead of divides, that brings folks together um, because us being divided, I think it's to their benefit. And so I found the class language of class very useful in that way. It bundles folks together. It's a language that it already exists in, in our vocabulary. Folks intuitively understand what it is. And so I found it useful. And that's why I used it because I thought, well, the, the heck of it. But I am a political economist by training. So I, I, I could also go in the rabbit hole and challenge that, you know, the classic perspective that a class division only happens at the point of production. And in the essays, the housing question, Ailes defends that housing, it's the point of consumption, and therefore it's not a fundamental division. It's just one more of the problems that uh, the, the working class, um, the proletariat, it's faced with, and their product, their you know, power relations there and so on, but it's not the fundamental division. I think that needs revision. I think that needs revision for a number of, of, of reasons. I think it's a very gendered analysis to start with, like production versus reproduction. Uh, yes, production happens at the factory floor. Uh, reproduction happens at home. And if you have no, you know, no ability to, to control that environment because it's not yours, uh, it makes reproductive work uh, very hard. The other thing that I think it has changed dramatically since then is it's access to, to, to capital. It used to be that you know you needed some 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 physical plant or factory or something that you would, or, or or land of course that you used then as collateral 
you know, and, and to be able to borrow and then you borrow and you create yet another factory and you employ more people and then you kind of extract their surplus value of their work and then you kind of go use that as collateral and, and so on and so forth. So so you, you, you need it, like the production as, as an anchor point um, for a lot of the f- financing. Today you don't. Today you can have like a mortgage that you like half paid mortgage, walk into a bank, get a loan, buy a condo and off you go extracting income from the working class. The, the level of financialization of, of capitalism right now um, and, and how much it no longer even touches production, I think also kind of kind of change, should a little bit change a little bit the way we, we think about this. And the other important factor is, is the analysis of who are the most powerful, who, who, are, who, are, who, who is the leading, the kind of hegemonic bloc here nowadays. And, and when you look at it, the enemy. Yes, who, who, who is leading that, you know, that block of uh, you, you're going to find developers and, 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 and the real estate industry right on the top of that block. And so if they're the ones having that much influence in, in the political landscape and, 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 and in setting the kind of the hegemonic project according to their needs, I think they should be the ones kind of directly antagonized by the, the working class too. So I, I think there, 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 there's room there for, for revision of that view that it's only, you know, the working class. And, but you're right, it complicates things because it, it, the complicating fact that there's the homeowners who are workers, right? Of course. I want to ask about the, the landlord class for a second, right? Because, you know, I've been told over and over again about these mom and pop landlords or, you know, the old retiree who is using it as retirement income or you know all of these different stories i mean it's very different than what i live because when i look out my door i see every single building there's four or five different companies who own all of them but i'm being told that oh no uh, it's not all landlords are bad there's all of these kind uh, gentle old folk who are just using it as uh, their retirement income so so I, 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 yeah, I guess my question is, like, who is this landlord class? And is there a truth to the mom and pop landlord? There is relatively small and shrinking share of landlords that own one, two, three units or have small buildings. I think the size of the landlord is not actually that important. I think what's important is the relationship to the property and the fact that they are businesses and investors looking for high returns on their investment. If they own one condo, if they own 300 units, that fundamental relation with the property and with the tenant with whom they extract income from, it's the same. And I go after the mom and pop landlord myth quite a bit because if, if, if we may use sort of Marxist terms, in Gramscian terms specifically, we know that the, 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 the sort of dominance at the material level, it's aided by a culture that supports that material dominance, right? So there's the kind of the two levels where it happens. Um, and that at the culture level, what we have in Canada is this romanticized, almost in daring notion of home the landlords, as you described, to the point that often the financial security of both is equated as equally important. And I tell the story in the book when in the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote this report about the financial security of tenants saying, you know, this was before CERB was announced. It's like tenants cannot stay two months without work. They will fall into arrears. There's not enough savings there. We need to talk about rent forgiveness. And I got a lot of radio interviews and almost all hosts asked me, but what about the landlords? And I was like, seriously, is a pandemic? We're talking about the tenants who don't have enough savings and and your comeback is, what about the landlords? And then in the beginning, I was kind of surprised and shocked that that was the reaction. But 
then I start paying more attention to, to the narrative. And if you think the landlord is, in fact, you know, this old widow down the street, you know, renting a room uh, to, you know, to buy enough food and, 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 and survive the retirement. Yes, that sentence, what about the landlord, makes sense. But if you look at who landlords actually are, which is an entire chapter of the book, um, it, it makes a lot less sense because there, uh, there's a large part of them that are just financial instruments. Then you have a, a big chunk of corporate landlords, quite large corporations. Then you have other smaller businesses that own one, two, three buildings, still quite a, a, a large enterprises. And then you look at the individual investors and I looked at other financial, uh, like their, their finances and their, their average wealth is way, net wealth after that and, and, and taking into account mortgages. It's, it's, it's more than twice the, the average wealth in this country. So it is a very small number of, of, of landlords that fall into that category and they should never be the ones um, that we portray as, as representative Politicians love them because it's a fuzzy, warm story, right? And it allows them to do exactly what you described. Small businesses, right? We hear the same for them, red tape for small business. And it's all just really stuff that benefits corporations for the most part. And It's, it's like whenever we talk about increasing the minimum wage. Yeah. Right? Do you, yes, ever, exactly. see, do you ever see Amazon come out and say, we build an empire on low wage workers please don't fuck that up like we really need workers to continue to earn very little otherwise our model won't work we never hear that right so what do we hear we get you know we get mary mary owns a bakery shop down the street down main street and if we increase minimum wage mary and john won't be able to meet you know their 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 spend their 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 their, their, their bill pay their bills and they might have to put you know their employees out of work that's the narrative we're here and it, it's kind of the same it is the same because you know it's still reinforcing the idea that small or large scale that this extraction this exploitation is okay yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I hear all the time the phrase landlords provide housing. Job providers. Right? It's all the same language used back and forth. I, I saw a great uh, quote the other day on Twitter where someone said landlords provide housing like scalpers provide concert tickets. Right. But it, as, as much as like it, it seems people are so resistant. So many people are resistant to the idea like they hold on to the notion that landlords are, are are providing housing that without landlords we wouldn't have there, there would be no tenant class there would be we, we, we would not have any other alternative they've never heard of non-market solutions they've never heard of community land trust or cooperative housing or whatever it is like that's just not in our vocabulary or well i mean it's in our vocabulary but you know what i mean is it not in the common vocabulary it's not in the discourse no and we often let them get away with that that framing of they're susceptible to things that make them bring the rent up or that they will somehow be mediated by small policy changes or the market and I really do love the way that you go after that in many ways. But my favorite, because I kind of want to call this episode, housing isn't bananas. Because Santiago, it, it, it drives him a little bit nuts that our essential goods are, that the narrative around essential goods is the same as it would be chewing gum, that there's a threshold to be met and, and the market will regulate itself. And you really kind of, chew that up and spit it out. And I think Santiago would really appreciate that part of the discussion. So you want to help bust that myth for us that somehow if we just build, a, provide incentives for either more mom and pops, like Olivia Chow is proposing to do, you know, allow people to get financial incentives to turn their home into a three-story to to create units as a solution to both the sprawl problem and the supply problem that Ricardo will talk about. <laughs> uh, so, cause that is one of the policy. I know 
we talk about policies not really being all that effective, but most of them revolve around creating more supply. And I think some politicians are trying to couch it in, they're, they're marrying these two awful narratives, the mom and pop and the supply and demand, and as though they're, this is a, a more progressive solution to the housing crisis. We talk a lot about housing, but we don't talk enough about land on which housing is built. Um, land has some particular qualities that it makes it very different from other types of goods uh, that we talk about in supply and demand terms. Um, land is limited, land doesn't travel, doesn't move, um, and land appreciates in value over time. Uh, that's very different than most other goods that you can simply produce more and then you put in a container and you ship to the other side of the world and that after some time, if it has been used or if, even if it hasn't been used, it's kind of worth less than it used to be. Land is very different. So the supply and, and demand argument um, doesn't quite apply as, as well to this. If it applies well to other things, it's even another discussion, but definitely not to, to land and the housing built on land. And I'll give you an example that for, for folks in Toronto in particular, we, we resonate quite well. Um, it might be hard for us folks like us to think about this, but some people have too much money and they don't know what to do with it. They, they literally do not know where to put it. Um, Poor and things. so, <laughs> and and so they have they have all sorts of investments around the world where they like shovel money in in, in different places, right? And and then some of this is higher, like high risk investments, and some are moderate risk investments, and they want to balance it out to the risk portfolio. So they need something that is really safe, just kind of literally like something like a mattress where they can just kind of put their money, no one's going to find it, no one's going to take it away. And a condo downtown Toronto is the perfect place. It's, it serves the purpose of a safety box. You just buy it, and so that's where your money is. And, and if one is not enough, it doesn't fit all the money, you buy three or four, and you kind of just leave it there um, because it's just kind of a safe place to park your money. Um, so sometimes economists and, and, and geographers will call that like the role of, 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 of real estate as a store of value. Right, just literally a safety box. So that fact alone screws up the entire <laughs> supply and demand. We will build more, and houses prices are going to go down. Kind of argument, right? Um, also important to talk about land because it reminds us of the fact that we're up against um, a lot of of power, um, a lot of armed conflict, um, genocide, colonization, or fundamentally about land. Um, the fact that we're in so-called Canada, where it was exactly a project to take possession of land and therefore create markets for the exchange of land, the housing built on it, the financing of the housing built on it, and even more recently, a market for the financial um, instruments for the financing of the house that is built on that land. Um, it reminds us of how far capital will go to take land. Past and present to this very day, we see genocides being committed, being carried out in order to take possession of land. So that, like, so th that's the point that you lose, like, kind of like, it, it, it's lost on me that we try and talk about housing as not being political. Like, are you, are you fucking kidding me? Like, we're, 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 we're like watching a genocide that is intended to, 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 to re depossess folks, displace an entire people and take over land. And as we have seen here, and as we have seen in so many other places, that's how far capital will go to take land. And we want to say that there's some sort of policy win-win solution to the housing question. Um, yeah. What do you? What would you say to folks who? You know, there's a lot of leftists, Marxists, whatever label. I know folks don't like the labels, but people who understand this perspective, but still enter the discussion with the assumption that those folks own the land, that is done, 
there's not much we can do about the invention or the prevalence of private property. Are there mechanisms, do you believe, that we can undo that? Is our initiatives like community land trusts or whatnot ways to move in that direction besides a revolution? You know, as because little policy bits and pieces aren't going to do it. I think this conversation has made that clear. If it hasn't, people need to go and get the tenant class and read it themselves then. But that seems like, even to someone who knows, who hates John Locke and, and understands just how awful the concept of private property is, my brain has trouble seeing beyond. Because, <laughs> like... Maybe they operate from that because they're feeling like me, you know, they just, they're like, okay, well, we can't change that. What can we change? What, what is within the realm of possibility? And I hate thinking that way, but I know I've fallen into that hole here because of the way that I've looked at housing for the most part. So <laughs> um, I think before we get to that fundamental question of private property or no private property, um, we are unfortunately so far from it that the way I personally think about this is collective responses that move us towards more collective solutions rather than privatized individual solutions. Um, so what I like about land, community land trusts is one, it reminds us that we're talking about land fundamentally. Um, but second, that I think it's it's a move also in 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 more towards that collective um, response. Um, that's what I like about co-ops as well. Um, and that's um, one of the major problems with the focus on home ownership. Because home ownership is, you know, your individual ticket, supposedly, allegedly, arguable, depending, you know, on the manufacturers, but it is portrayed to be your um, individual ticket to, to, to kind of housing security and to um, financial security more uh, broadly. Um, so if we have more collective responses that take us to that collective versus the 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 the, the privatizing and individualized um, responses that now liberalism has has really emphasized I think are steps in a good direction and 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 the other problem is is always um, my personal fear of um, of getting too intellectual about this too right and and, and remembering that some of those policy tweaks um, are definitely not the solution, uh, but they could have an impact on on folks' ability to to you know buy decent boots for their kids the next winter. Um, and I'm talking about things like you know rent controls, for example, and and um, policies that make evictions legal. And, and, and things like that that would operate within the existing state apparatus and, 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 and even within some of the well, the, the political consensus-ish that we have right now, but it could have an impact on that. But again, it's how we go about it, I think, that is important. Um, if, we, if we all sort of think that, you know, participating in the formal consultations is the way of going... Um, Hopefully not all of us. <laughs> yeah, like no, no, exactly. We're gonna free up no. some man person power there. No, yes, and and or maybe all of it. You know, I don't think that's the 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 like that's how you get those things. You know, um, and and it's a waste of time. So so if if you're if you if you're building response capacity, if you're building, you know, if you're organizing and 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 building capacity and ability to 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 push politically. Um, and you go and try to push for rent controls as for ex as an example and that say fails 
at least that exercise, you know, you continue to, to, to build from that exercise and you still, that process wasn't wasted, right? If you put all your energy and, 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 participate in some 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 official consultation as individual organizations or as as separated from each other and then doing their own little submissions and you send all of the submissions and the government absolutely ignores them and doesn't go anywhere i think that was a, a huge waste of time right so if if we push for some of this policy tweaks as part of as a political project and as part of of and as exercises that increase our capacity to fight for that and for other things i think those fights can 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 be um fruitful one way or the other um but the trap is 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 the formal channels of participation i like how we've kind of come full circle back to the need for tenant organizing for its many purposes right? whether it's public pressure, physical resistance, community building. It's, I think as the last year has gone by and we've talked more about that, I think I'm slowly coming around to, it's almost the solution because it organizes us by neighborhood, by proximity, already by community. Because workplaces, you don't even necessarily work. I mean, please still organize your workplaces. That is not off the table whatsoever. But nothing surely could beat neighborhood unions throughout. And uh, especially if they were interconnected with one another. Because we're seeing the power of the even the tenant unions that were in Toronto that are sometimes just like one building, two building, but they, they are working together quite a bit and we're seeing a lot of progress really fast. So, you know, cause I know there's a lot of people listening that, that do many tactics that are lobbying government for policy change that do, that are policy wonks, right. And, and find a lot of purpose in, in that, but surely like the act of organizing our communities has to take kind of priority over those resources. So two things there. First, collective bargaining rights for tenants um, would be more important than rent controls in my perspective. Because rent controls... Does that you, exist you, anywhere? Um, only in Sweden, to my knowledge. And um, in the 1960s, the NDP in BC promised it. Um, and then they were elected and then did implement it. Um, but um, there has been, you know, every now and then it, the term and, and, and some movement around it arises. Um, but that, you know, that would be um, because the legislation, as, as, as many of you know, the legislation allows tenants to organize, but doesn't force tenants to recognize organize tenants as an official uh, political interlocutor. Um, so they don't have to negotiate and they don't. I think we've seen with the rent strikes in Toronto a very concerted and deliberate effort to not recognize tenant unions as legitimate interlocutors with the tenants in those buildings. Um, because I think the landlord class understands the peril of, of, of the rising in organizing um, and what it would mean to have um, collective bargaining rights or to, what would mean to have the, the tenant associations recognized. That's one point I wanted to make. The other point that you made about all the other folks who are not doing direct organizing, that includes myself. Um, I think... The conversation that I'm trying to have with colleagues is, yes, if you do policy or if you do research or if, like outside of academia or inside of academia, um, if you do other work that is not direct organizing, can you shift the way you work to make sure that whatever you do is directly supporting organizing? Um, how do we do that? How do we think about that? What would that mean in practice is some of the conversations that I'm having. So my colleagues in academia 
I, I, I push them to do research that is for and not about tenant movements. I tell them, you don't need to write another article about what tenant movements do. They know it. They did it. Like, you know, it, it, you don't need to go there and write a detailed description of how the, the strike came about. They, they organized it. They did it. They, they know all the details. That piece will not um, really uh, help anyone that is on the ground, right? Um, so ask the movement what 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 is where are you and where's your fight and uh, what are the the, the 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 myths that you you're facing what's the the narratives the media is pushing for that is not helpful what what can what can we do that would support you and i think with the, some of the policy folks it would be the same it would be applicable too we need to rechannel resources there is an enormous amount of resources in this society a time, money, working hours that it's wasted in these futile conversations with government and we need to move that money and, and, and put more resources towards, towards the organizing. That's like what our whole show is about, Ricardo. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> there you go. We've lost hope in politicians and the political system for personal reasons and through our experience, you know, talking to people and, and academia ourselves. But yeah, it's... It's time that folks kind of refocus that. we. I have great frustration with, with really good people spinning their wheels or perhaps doubling up on work. And I love the idea of doing pieces for movements rather than about. And I think like Santiago, that could equally be applied to journalism because we've talked about, you know, fuck being unbiased. That doesn't exist anyway. So... Just don't even think about it and and examine and and write pieces and do work that we do to that end. And I think we try, right? We, we want whatever our, our, our interviewees what are, are trying to get across. We try to inf- reinforce that as much as possible. But surely that's a noble way to apply a lot of the work that folks do, right? Not just academia, not just journalism, but whatever kind of day job you might be stuck in <laughs> um, or whatever niche you've you've gained expertise on. Um, because, yeah, there's just so many roles to play here. Yeah, we will end on the same note that the bo- book ends, which I think is a bit redundant to your audience, but is always, I think, worth repeating that there is no win-win solution to this. And anyone engaged with the housing question has to pick a side. You, you are with capital and with the land owning class or you are on the other side of this. There's, there's, no, there's no in between. There's no neutral. Um, pick a side and, um, and join the struggle. <laughs> That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.